you know that the main thing isn't the speaker? How many of you know the main thing isn't the worship? I mean, it's just me up here, I can't actually see you. Is there anybody out there? Does anybody know the main thing's not the speaker? Anybody know the main thing's not the worship? The main thing is Jesus. The main thing is Jesus. And my heart tonight is that by the end of this evening, you would know Jesus more in your life. That's my heart and my passion. It's my honour to be able to speak to you uh, tonight. My, my, my real desire is that when you leave here, that you won't be talking to people about speak. You won't be talking to them about any individual thing. Because you'll know what Jesus did in your life. You won't be talking to them about Jesus. There's all sorts of people that are involved in making an event like this happen. And it would be ridiculous for me to try and name them all because I would forget somebody and I would get myself into terrible trouble. And I can naturally get myself into terrible trouble without actually setting myself traps. So, I would love for you, on behalf of everybody that served you um, in the last couple of days, give them a massive wow round of applause. I've loved being here the last few days. Some of my heroes have been here and to hear them sharing stuff that has gone into your hearts and gone into my heart has blessed me so much. And, and I get the honour of actually being the last person to speak to you before we worship God again. And, uh, and, and, and I'm not going to say anything to you, in fact, I think, that contradicts a word that anybody said. It's just going to underline and hopefully reinforce what other people have said to you. What people say as their last thing is very important. The last thing you hear is very important. The disciples in Matthew 28 will come up on screen. Let me just say um, right now, um, I need to um, uh, make an apology already. You see, the way that I'm wired is if you were talking to me, I like information to come to me in short, sharp bursts. That's the best way that I deal with things. And then when I'm explaining things, I just scatter it all over the place. So basically, if anything goes wrong with this presentation that goes on behind me, it's not their fault. It's my fault because I'll be running in the wrong order, okay? But already I know that they've got it right because we're starting in the right place. Matthew 28. And it says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped. And they, uh, 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 they worshipped and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Right, first thing I want to say is, we've not come to the end of the age. So that which Jesus said then is still true now. The first point uh, I want to also say to you is that we as a church and disciples are called to go. There's no surprises there. It's in the Word. And I've even put in big letters on the PowerPoint. We are called to go. Now Jesus says, and he says to you, come follow me. And then he says, to go. Now many of us and many churches have embraced the first part, to come. Fewer have not even considered the second part to go. Now a church should be an inviting place. But a church that spends all of its time inviting people and telling people to come looks very different to a church that tells people to come and then to go. You see, a coming church is faced this way. It's faced in on itself. And a going church is faced outwards towards a hurting world. We're called to come to Jesus and then to go. Now you, as young people, have got something in you that actually we all carry. I still have it myself. And it's this. You were designed for adventure and risk. The problem is, so often, 
the church, and I love the church. I, I love the church. I'm a, I'm a member of a church. I lead a church. I love the church. I'm a leader of the church. But so often the church is preoccupied in keeping people happy. And it misses the main point. It misses that subconscious need that is within you for adventure and risk. We're so busy entertaining ourselves, we're entertaining ourselves to death. And I want to say to each and every one of you, you were born for such a time as this. You were born for such a time as this. You see, you're not an accident. God wanted you to be here right now. You were born for such a time as this. A number of years ago, when um, uh, almost like at the beginning of the night, um, I met a young woman, and uh, she, she's just so passionate for Jesus. So passionate for Jesus. And I watched her journey. I watched what God did in her life. And I saw when she talked about this nation, she would cry. And it inspired me, and it inspires me still. And about, when she was about 15 or 16, I heard her share a story. Something that was on her heart. Something that God had birthed in her heart. And she spoke on the book of Esther. She's here tonight. I'm not going to embarrass her, but she knows who she is. And she can preach on Esther better than I can because it's the book that God's written into her heart. But let me just quickly um, recap the story of Esther. There was, a, there was a bad king. He was a nasty guy. He liked to drink. And when he was drunk, he divorced his wife. Okay? And then, because he was a bit crazy and he was taking advice, he decided he wanted another wife. But not just one wife. He decided to have a beauty contest. And pick the best. And pick the best. And he picked a young woman. And she was a young Jewish woman. And she was called Esther. And she was brought into his palace. Now Esther had an uncle. He was more like a stepfather to her. And when the girl went, the father followed. And he hung out around the edge of the palace. And then one day, a general went to the king and he said, and he said I've got a bright idea. Why don't you give me permission to wipe out all the Jews? To wipe out what were all God's people? And the king was slightly distracted and he said, okay. And Mordecai heard this. Mordecai, the stepdad, heard this and he got the attention um, of, of his daughter. And he said, you've got to go and you've got to tell the king that he can't do this. Now, let me just pause there. I want to say to you, have you ever been in that place where you were known this is what I was born for. This is what I was made for. There, there, there's some, sometimes those things don't happen very often. And sometimes you were only aware of them after the event. I've had a few occasions in my life. I remember once in the depth of winter being on the uh, English and Welsh border. And I got a three wood. And I hit a ball beautifully. And it went onto the green. And that doesn't sound remarkable, but you've never seen me play golf. And I went, yes, I was born for such a day as this. When you play golf as badly as I do, it's not about having a good round. It's about having a good shot one day in your life. That was it. But I, 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 I've seen more than that when I've been in tune with God. That I've been able to do some things where I've gone, yes, God. This was a day you designed me for. I was in the right place at the right time. My circumstances were suddenly preordained, and, and everything that's happened up until this point was like a preparation for what happened today. So Esther is inside the palace. And Mordecai, like a good dad, is hanging about, and he hears what's going to happen. And he says to me, you've got to get the king's attention. And she said, you don't understand, it's not like that, it's not so easy. If I go to the king he will get, and, and he doesn't welcome me, I could get killed. You see, she sees the practical nature of the problem. She sees dry bones. He sees an army. When we look at Wales and we look at the desperate nature of the spiritual land, we can see dry bones. Or we can see an army. He suggests us something that looks impossible. And while she's making the sensible comments, she's thinking of herself and not for the greater good. And before we all get sniffy about Esther, let's be honest, 
So often the decisions that we're making are about what feels good for us and what's for the day, not for the greater good. And then Mordecai says to her this. And I'd not seen this until I reread this passage a little while ago. And he says to her, If you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance from the Jews will arrive, arise from another place. Wow. I don't know if you know the significance of that. He's basically saying the plans and purposes of God will come about. God will build his church and nothing will stop that happening. Nothing's going to stop that happening. You're not going to stop that happening. If you can't be bothered, it's still going to happen. It's still going to happen. But God didn't design you not to be bothered. He designed you to be part of it. When we don't do what God asks, God still gets on with the work of the kingdom anyway. But there are consequences of us not doing what God asks us to do. We live for such a time as this. You cannot change your past. Your past is gone. Amen to that. Fantastic. But you, you can use your present to affect your future and the future of countless others. I don't know about you, but when I started getting serious about my faith, I began to realise it was a revolutionary battle I was involved in. And here's what I began to think. I, I'm nothing. I, I can't do anything. You see, at my heart, I'm a revolutionary. I want to change everything by 180 degrees. And, and as I started about you know, trying to make a difference, I was seeing things were changing 180 degrees. And, and I easily get frustrated. And then... I was introduced to something that transformed my thinking. <laughs> it's called chaos theory. Chaos theory. You ever heard about this? It's about butterflies flapping their wings. You heard about this? It's great. It's a great idea. The inventors, or the people who discovered chaos theory, the guy who really discovered it was a meteorologist. And he began to think about how the fact that we've got the biggest computers in the world that are predicting what's happening with the weather, but we get it wrong. We get it wrong. We get it wrong so often. Why is that? And then he began to realize that little things affect other things massively. And he suggested this initially just for weather, and then we realized it had impact in the wider world. He said... And this was his theory. If a butterfly flaps its wings in Japan, it can con con uh, contain, it can contribute or cause a massive earthquake or a tornado or a cyclone right on the other side of the world. Then the flapping wings of a butterfly can cause an earthquake on the other side of the world. Now, I want to suggest to you that that butterfly, when it flaps its wings, has no idea of the impact it's having on the other side of the world. And some of you are going, oh yeah, I get it. And others are going, all we can see is a butterfly behind you. We don't know what you're talking about. Let me tell you why it revolutionised my thinking. I was born in 1962. That means I'm 51 years old. And during my childhood, they put a man on the moon. It was suggested in 1963, an outrageous thought that we could put a man on the moon. By 1969, we had done it. Now, in order to put men on the moon, they didn't have like brilliant, brilliant computers. They didn't even have as much power as you would have on the calculator in your phone. They worked most of it out with slide and with their brains. But it's just quite a scary thought because here's the deal. The moon is approximately 
140,000 miles away from Earth. Uh, we got a picture of the moon anyway, just in case anybody doesn't know what the moon looks like. There you go, there's the moon. That's brilliant, isn't it? 240,000 miles away. And they realised they had to send a rocket up to it. And they began to calculate what is the tolerance. In other words, what mistake could we make and still get a rocket to the moon? And they began to think, well, what's the smallest number we could work to? And it was this number, 0.0003 of a degree. And if they did that and the rocket took off, now for my even have a film of a rocket taking off for you in a minute. A Saturn V rocket, the biggest thing that's ever left the Earth. When a rocket took off, if it was 0.003 of a degree wrong, it would miss the moon by one and a quarter miles. By the time it got 240,000 miles, it would miss the moon by a mile and a quarter. And you say to me, Gary, well that's not very, that's not, that's not far. Well, it's a problem. And let me tell you what is a problem. If you miss the moon, you're not going to hit anything else. You're just going to disappear. You're going to go to the final frontier where no rocket has ever gone before. If they miscalculated by 1%, it would miss it by 416 miles. They're trying to think about putting um, a probe on Mars. Um, uh, uh, Mars is a little bit further away from us than the moon. It's actually 35.8 million miles away when it's at its closest. A 1% miscalculation here means they would miss the moon by 61,984 miles. That's a big miss. 1% makes a difference. If you could change the world, change your community, change your behaviour to be more like Christ by 1%, that would have phenomenal impact. You don't need to change your world by 180 degrees. You just need to change the whole world by one degree. You might not see yourself as a history maker, but I tell you what I do because I believe you've all got more power than a butterfly to flap its wings. I believe that. I believe that with all my heart. If I wasn't, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. At the heart of our lives, at the heart of our church, is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. He was willing to die for us and he was willing to die for all. A 1% change is no big deal. And here's the big message that I want to say. You've heard lots and lots of things um, and challenges being thrown out to you in the last 24 hours. And the final one I want to throw out to you is this. Everybody's got to do something. Everybody's got to do something. You were designed to be here for such a time as this. Everybody's got to do something. You can't use the I don't know as an excuse. You've got to do something. Esther decided to go for it. She said to Mordecai this, she said, Go gather together all the Jews are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, and I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it's against the law, and if I perish, I perish. This is what she said. I'm going. I'm going. Fast and pray. If God tells you not that I shouldn't go, let me know. But other, I'm going. She's already made her mind up. She's on the journey. Everybody's got to do something. What are you going to do? And some people say, oh, oh yeah, but, but I don't know what God wants me to do. I don't know what God's direction is. God isn't trying to put you at a difficult crossroads where you're just confused, looking round. What shall I do? What, shall, what if I go wrong? What if I go wrong? What, what happens if I go wrong? So often God is just saying, go. I'm going to be with you to the very ends of the earth. Go. I'm going to be with you if you go to the left, if you go to the right, if you 
just go in my name. So much easier to change the direction of a moving vehicle than it is to get a vehicle started. Start moving. Listen to God. He'll tell you exactly what he wants you to do. In the 21st century church, sometimes we've placed a high value on what we call deep spiritual contemplation. And I call it this, doing nothing. Doing nothing. Everyone has to do something. 